Some years ago, KLM decided to purchase Airbus 330 aircraft to replace its Boeing 767 fleet. This decision seemed strange when analyzing KLM's current fleet, which mainly consists of Boeing aircraft. So why did KLM take this decision? What's so special about the A330? And why will the A330 be powered by General Electric engines? These kinds of questions will be answered in the following 20 minutes during our A330 introductory tour. This film includes five different parts. Part 1 Structure Part 2 Passenger Comfort Part 3 Flight Deck Part 4 Engine and Part 5 Cargo Operations Our tour starts with a short stop at the Operations Control Center, the heart of KLM operations in which all activities of the KLM fleet are monitored worldwide 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. One of the key players in the Operations Control Center is Fleet Services, the linking pin between operations and maintenance. I'm René Kalman, I'm the head of Fleet services and uh, one of the projects that we currently manage is the uh, introduction of the A330 um, in the fleet of KLM. Why did KLM buy uh, the A330? Well, uh, first of all, when you buy a new airplane, the payload range combination is very important. How much payload, how many passengers, and how, how many tons of cargo can you transport over what distance? This is very important in view of the network um, and it's the first selection uh, criterion. The delivery of the first A330 will be at the end of August. As far as we can see it now, the airplane would arrive at Schiphol on the 25th of, uh, of August and the numbers uh, T23 and 4 will arrive in September, November of 2005 and the number 4 in April of 2006 and the later airplanes will follow subsequently. The A330 is designed and manufactured by Airbus, world leader in aircraft manufacturing and main competitor of the Boeing company. With its main production facilities in Toulouse, Airbus strives to incorporate new materials in its aircraft in order to enhance the overall performance. Technological breakthroughs have resulted in the establishment of low resistance design and the development of the so-called composite materials. Hans Poolgeest, A330 project engineer of the engineering department, tells us how the low aerodynamic resistance, otherwise known as drag, is established. Each new aircraft you try to develop um, as smooth as possible to make sure that you have uh, the least drag. Um, what Airbus has done uh, is, is, is quite interesting. They have developed a system where the center of gravity of the aircraft is maintained at an ideal position and they do that by using uh, fuel, fuel which is transported to the tail tank and during flight they constantly move the, the, the fuel to, uh, to a position where the center of gravity is at the ideal position and this saves a lot of drag. In their continuous pursuit of design improvement Airbus has also expanded the areas in which composites have been applied. Hans Poolgeest explains the advantages of composites. Uh, the use of composites is um, that composite material is not prone to fatigue or corrosion. Um, it's lighter in weight. The problem is that it's difficult, more difficult to con construct. So it, it will cost more to, uh, to have something of composite material. On the A330, the following major items are made out of composite materials. 
the engine cowling, the aerodynamic fairing between the wing root and the fuselage, the so-called belly fairing skin, the upper and lower leading and trailing edge panels of the flight controls and their moving surfaces, the winglet and wingtip trailing edge, the fin box including the rudder, the horizontal stabilizing outer boxes, including the elevators. And something remarkable, a completely new technology has resulted in the application of composites in two uncommon areas, the pressure bulkhead and the support struts for the passenger floor. The aircraft itself, um, it has a large wing, 60 meters wide, uh, tail is about 17 meters high. Um, 58 meters long, total aircraft. Um, there are 10 wheels to put it on the runway. Two on the nose and the rest, of course, on the main uh, trucks. It can take 110, approximately 140,000 liters, which makes it a long-range aircraft. Uh, the maximum takeoff weight of the 8030 is 233,000 kilograms, which is 50 tons more than the 767, so that's quite a comparison. We have now seen the structural innovations. Let's see what's new in the cabin. My name is Jan van Meulen from uh, InFlight Services. I'm the project manager of the introduction of the A330 at our department. The role of InFlight Services with the introduction of the A330 is uh, to make a cabin which is workable for the, for the cabin crew and with that to give the best service to the passengers. The number of passengers on this aircraft is uh, 251. It's uh, 30 business class passengers and 221 in the economy class. The seats in the economy class and the business class are the same as on the 777. However, there is a huge difference in seat configuration. A philosophy of Airbus is to avoid a triple seat configuration. After all, would you choose a middle seat? The IATA Corporate Air Travel Survey 2002 shows that 0% of the passengers want to sit in the middle. 97% of the passengers prefer an aisle or window seat. This is why Airbus has opted for even seat combinations. The interior of the A330 is available in many standard configurations. For example, the three-class long-range 253 seats, the two-class medium-range 293 seats, the single-class 343 seats, and a single-class high-density with 380 seats. In addition to the standard cabin configurations, Airbus also offers customized programs. KLM has chosen such a program in which the cabin appears as shown here. Provisions for the installation of a crew rest are available, although no crew rest will be installed on the KLM fleet as of yet. The galley is located in the middle of the business class section. The KLM A330 will be equipped with seven toilets, located in the center and aft part of the cabin. Two of the toilets are fit for disabled passengers. These are located in the center section of the aircraft. The in-flight entertainment system uh, on board of the A330 is the same as on the uh, 777. So that means that we do have nose to tail in-flight entertainment interactive on this aircraft. The person can control all the systems in the cabin by the cabin management system. And that is a typical Airbus uh, system which is very user-friendly and uh, they can control the, the lights in the cabin and the lights are very special. You can, can let them up very slowly and let them go down very slowly. You also can see on that screen if the, all the doors are open or closed. The water waste system is uh, also visible on that screen. Airbus is clearly focused on increasing passenger comfort. Not only can this be found in the cabin layout, but also in the cabin noise level. 
Airbus even claims that the A330 has the quietest cabin ever. This high level of comfort can also be found on the flight deck. The design of a good flight deck is of major importance to any airline. Flight deck commonality has been an objective for Airbus ever since the 80s. This means that pilots of Airbus aircraft only need a short three-day training to be able to fly different Airbus types within a family. At the Operations Control Center we visited Mark Brower, engineering pilot of the A330. We asked him how many pilots have already been trained for the A330. Um, at this moment we have uh, six KLM pilots who are already trained for the uh, Airbus 330. Uh, we fly with Air France uh, presently, but uh, we got our training in Toulouse with Airbus. Um, we specifically choose Airbus because when we were trained with Air France we had the Air France way of flying. The A330 flight deck has been designed for a two-member cockpit crew. It also includes a dark cockpit philosophy. Mark Brower explains what this is. Dark cockpit uh, philosophy, um, that is uh, the same as with Boeing aircraft. Uh, so if there's nothing wrong, there is no light somewhere in the cockpit. So if it is dark, everything is fine. In a normal situation, the flight deck will be scarcely illuminated, looking like this. Whenever there's a failure, a light will come up immediately and in some cases an oral message. Ergonomics have also led to the so-called no-eye scanning philosophy, which means that all primary flight information can be readily seen by the pilots without them having to move their heads. Another extraordinary feature on the A330 flight deck is the so-called side stick. The side stick is used for steering the aircraft using yet another new technology, fly-by-wire. Now what is fly-by-wire? And what's the difference between fly-by-wire and the conventional way of steering? Let us first explain the conventional method. For steering an aircraft, you need flight controls. One of them is the flight control system of an elevator. The elevator makes the airplane go up and down. With the following animation, we explain how it works. When the control column is moved forward, the input quadrant will rotate and move the differential quadrant via steel cables. On the differential quadrant, an input rod is installed which moves the green input lever and gives a command via the hydraulic steering unit to the elevator. Now let's see how the fly-by-wire system works. Again, we want to move the elevator. The fly-by-wire system of the Airbus uses computers to move the flight controls. This time, the input is given by the side stick. The output of the side stick is transmitted to a computer through electrical signals. As a result, the computer commands the hydraulic steering unit. The steering unit controls the elevator. No steel cables are involved. Imagine the reduction in weight. The new aircraft position is measured by sensors called aircraft response. The aircraft response signal is used to maintain the new position and to operate the aircraft within safe limits. Mark Brower has a good example of what it means to operate within safe limits. Um, if you want to avoid a mountain, let's say, which is one of the worst cases that could happen in aviation, um, if you pull the side stick fully uh, in a normal aircraft, uh, you will eventually stall the aircraft. The nose will go down, the aircraft will descend, you will hit the mountain. In an Airbus aircraft, if you pull the side stick fully aft, uh, it will have the exact um, maximum of the, uh, the uh, lift to uh, weight ratio, or the lift to drag ratio, I should say. So you have maximum climb performance to clear the mountain, which is more safe, of course. Another safety item on this aircraft is the Ram Air Turbine, RAT, located in the right-hand wing in the flap track fairing number four. In case of an emergency, the RAT delivers hydraulic power instantaneously, which ensures the controllability of the aircraft and makes a safe landing possible. We conclude the long list of A330 features with one that KLM specifically requested, the electronic flight bag. No other airline has this system in an Airbus plane yet. The electronic flight bag 
removes all paperwork from the flight deck. The pilot manuals are now digital and they are displayed via a screen in the flight deck. Mark Brower tells us more about it. We intend to uh, operate the uh, Airbus uh, with an electronic flight bag. Um, it's uh, not new. The 777 has an electronic flight bag as well. Um, the system is designed a little bit different uh, in the Airbus uh, because the system is connected to the FlySmart system. Uh, FlySmart is a network which is on board of the aircraft, it's in the whole aircraft. So also the, um, the purser panel is connected to it, there are several outlets in the aircraft uh, connected to this network, uh, which has the advantage that the ground engineer can take his own laptop connected to the onboard network and retrieve all relevant data from the uh, maintenance computers or whatever. My name is Jan de Vroomen. I'm working for Engine Services uh, in Engineering and Maintenance of KLM. Um, my function is Program Manager CF6 ADC2 and in, I will be responsible for the maintenance program of the engine that will be uh, flying uh, on the AD A330 aircraft, which is the ADE1 engine. As Jan de Vroomen mentioned, the KLM A330 will be powered by General Electric engines. There are more suitable types of engines for this airplane, like Rolls-Royce or Pratt & Whitney, but Jan de Vroomen explains why KLM chose the GE CF6 ATE-1. Um, the ADE engine is an engine that is uh, specially designed for the operation for the A330. It's, uh, in general, it's an engine that's uh, in design uh, is, is very similar to the CF6 ADC2 engine that we're already operating under the 747, the 767 and the MD11. But this engine has more thrust, uh, uh, it has a thrust of 72,000 pounds, um, which is needed for this aircraft. Uh, of course, there are also other engines that can be uh, operating uh, under this aircraft, for instance, our uh, part in Northwest is flying a Pratt & Whitney engine. Uh, in this case for KLM it was a logical choice to choose for the GE engine because that fits in the product line of the, uh, of the shop. On the other hand, uh, of course, there has been made a comparison mainly on uh, life cycle cost uh, made for the, for the, before this engine was chosen. Let's see what this engine is capable of. To clarify this, we have some everyday examples for you. The power of the engine is comparable to 400 car engines. The amount of fuel that one engine consumes is approximately 3.5 liters per second during takeoff. The amount of air that flows through the engine during takeoff has the volume of 2.5 average houses per second. The maximum speed of the A330 with GE CF6 ATE1 engines is 833 kilometers cruise speed per hour. The altitude is approximately 41,000 feet, which is the same as 12 kilometers. And the maximum range of a fully loaded A330 is 12,500 kilometers. The engine is the most expensive part of this $150 million aircraft. We consider it as one component, but obviously it consists of many parts. And roughly uh, an ADE-1 bare engine uh, costs about $14 million. And on top of that you need some uh, external parts and interfaces, uh, which adds another over $2 million. In total, roughly $16 million. It's uh, worth one engine. For the last part of our presentation, we go on to the cargo department. Rick van der Pluim, Project Manager Network Planning KLM Cargo, tells us what the introduction of the A330 means for his organization. Introduction of the A330 means that uh, we have uh, a standard product now throughout our network with pallets and containers. 
It also means that we have an increase of 25% on the cargo capacity side, both in volume and in weight, compared to the Boeing 767 aircraft type that the A330 is replacing. The maximum cargo capacity in volume is around 14 tons, but depending on the route and the passenger and baggage loads, we can achieve a cargo traffic of up to 20 tons on the A330. The cargo containers on the A330 are standard in the industry and we use the LD3 containers throughout our intercontinental fleet, so it's also on the 747s, but also on the MD11 and on the freighter aircraft. On the current 767, a non-standard type of loader container is used, which cannot be interchanged easily in our network. With this A330 introductory tour, we have given you the basics of the A330 aircraft and explained why KLM bought the A330. If you want to fly a KLM A330, from September 2005, she is ready to take you to the North Atlantic, Africa and the Middle East. We hope to see you on the next Airbus flight.